This is a Geonics EM38 Mark II electromagnetic induction instrument. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up and use this instrument along with the data collector to collect data from a grid. I won't be demonstrating nulling and zeroing the instrument or explaining how electromagnetic induction works. Please see our other videos on those topics and reference the manual that was created as part of this project. This video was supported by a grant from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training of the National Park Service. Okay, what we have laid out here is a 10 by 10 meter grid to demonstrate how we're going to use this instrument for survey in automatic data collection mode. Most of the time when we use this instrument, we are going to start in the southwest corner of the grid and our first traverse will be headed north. So this is our southwest corner. The corners are marked with pin flags. We have set out a baseline here along the south that is 10 meters and a baseline up there that is 10 meters. At each meter mark along the baseline, we've stretched tapes uh, to help us guide ourselves during data collection. So the tapes that we use to guide the traverses are marked at every meter with red. We use those marks in conjunction with the metronome and the instrument to pace ourselves when we're using the instrument to collect data in automatic mode. So we've only got the first four tapes set out here. Oftentimes there will be more traverses in your grid than you have tapes. So as survey moves along, these tapes at the beginning will no longer be needed. Once the operator has collected these traverses, these tapes can be pulled up, leapfrogged over, and set out in front. Normally we will have two or three people working on collecting data from a grid like this. We will have one person actually running the instrument, and we will have one or two others moving tapes and taking notes. Taking notes is really, really important and can be very useful. Most times things go smoothly, but if they don't, you want to have something written down so you can figure out what the problem was. In this case, we're going to survey a 10 by 10 meter grid. So I'm going to say that each one of these, I'm going to draw just a little scale map here. Each one of those is two meters. So I'm just going to draw a little sketch of our grid. I'm going to indicate where north is. Uh, this gives me space to write down the file name that we will create. Um, under which the data collector will store data from this grid, and it also gives me a place to write down the stop and start stations of different transects, whether there are obstacles, whether we had to redo a line, um, what the settings were when we nulled and zeroed, uh, and so on and so forth. If a survey goes smoothly, most of the time you won't have to refer back to these notes. If there was a problem, though, these notes will give you a better chance of determining what that problem was and figuring out how to fix it. So this is what it looks like when the instrument is all set up and ready to go. The extender arm is attached, the data collector is attached and an external battery pack is attached. Okay, we're going to start the EM38 software by tapping on it. This is the first screen that shows up. The survey setup button lets you choose some key parameters for your survey. Under mode, you have the choice between auto and manual. We are going to choose auto because we are going to collect data in automatic mode. Readings per second is set to eight. That means the instrument will take eight readings every second. So if we move at a rate of one meter per second, uh, the instrument will take a reading every 12.5 centimeters. We're going to operate the instrument in vertical dipole mode. Again, I'm not going to explain what that is here, but we cover that in other videos and in the manual. For survey line, we're going to start on survey line 1. Our line increment is 1, which means that it is going to increment the survey line number by 1 every time we move to a different line. We're going to start off with an alternate sequence, which means we will do our first survey line headed north, and we will turn around and we will head south. If we choose one way in this box, we would go north, we would turn around, walk back around, and start our next survey line from the south baseline. So we're going to start with alternate. Our direction of first survey is going to be north. Our start station is going to be 1, because we are going to start at station 1. And our station increment is going to be 1. That means for every reading, it is going to increment the station number by 1, so it's going to go in a positive direction. After you have your survey setup done, you're going to hit the monitor log button. You're going to get an error message, which you are going to ignore. This lets you create a file where you're going to store your data. It automatically brings up a file name, which includes the date and the time. You can change it to anything you want, but we found that keeping the file name with the date and the time is handy. Whatever file name you choose, you're going to want to write it down in your notes. Save your file name, and it exits you to a screen that lets you start collecting data. Down here in the bottom right, there is a Go button. Once you hit that Go button, the instrument will start collecting. It's a good idea to get some practice pacing with this instrument before you use it to collect actual data. You'll notice that I'm holding the data collector upside down in my hand. 
That gives my thumb access to the enter button, which I can use to stop and start the instrument. When I start it, you will hear the metronome go. So it's now collecting data. I can stop it with that button as well. When you're collecting actual data, you want to move the instrument at a steady pace so that the back sensor of the instrument lines up with one of the red marks on the tape every time the metronome beeps. This takes a little bit of practice. Some people like to start from a dead stop. I like to get the instrument in motion and then hit the start button as I'm going over the bass line. Okay, once you've got your pace down, you can start collecting data. You'll notice that as I walk along here and collect this first traverse, I am not on the tape. I am 25 centimeters off of the tape. When I do my traverse coming back, I will be 25 centimeters off of this tape. So I'll be collecting data at 25 centimeters along the baseline, 75 centimeters along the baseline, 1 meter 25 along the baseline, 175 along the baseline. So you'll notice as I finished, rather than trying to stop data collection right at that baseline, I just went ahead and collected, and once I was safely past it, I hit the stop button. We can trim that extra data off in processing, so it's no big deal, and it gives you a little bit of a safety cushion. It's difficult to try to stop and start this thing exactly where you want to be, so you give yourself a little bit of room for error. Now when we head back for traverse number two, we're going to be starting at the 75 centimeter line along the north baseline. We're going to use this tape to align ourselves and keep pace and we're going to need to enter a little bit of new information in the data collector before we get going. At the end of Traverse 1, we have stopped at Station 86. On a 10 meter long Traverse, we are going to have 80 readings, so we went a little bit past that before we stopped. So we're going to get ready to turn around and go to Traverse number 2. So we hit the Line button. This tells us our current line is 1, which is what we just did. Our last station was 86. Our new line is going to be 2. We're doing an alternate sequence. We are headed south. We're going to start at station 80. And our station increment is negative 1. In other words, as we go south along this traverse, the station number is going to decrease by 1 each time the instrument takes a reading. So that is all fine, so we're going to hit OK. We are now ready for traverse 2. Up here at the top, it tells us we are at line 2. We are starting at station 80. So I'm going to turn the data collector back so I can access the button with my thumb. I'm going to put our stylus back in its holster and get it ready to go. So for the return trip on Traverse 2, my goal is to have the rear sensor of the instrument passing over the baseline as I start data collection. That will be Station 80, and we'll end up at Station 1 on the south baseline. So at the end of Traverse 2, we ended up at station negative 10. That's because our grid actually ends at station 1, and we traveled beyond it. We will cut off that data during processing. To get ready to go back again, we simply hit line. This tells us our new line is going to be line 3, which is correct. Our line increment is 1. Sequence is alternate. Now we're headed north again. Our start station, we need to change to be 1. We are at start station 1, and the station increment is 1, which means the station numbers will increase as we head north again. So we hit OK. Now we are ready for line 3, which on our tape will be at a meter 25. So we will use the second tape on the way back to a line. In an actual survey, our normal practice is to note the start and stop stations and the position along the baseline of each and every traverse. Periodically, the person running the instrument and the person taking notes We'll check in with each other to make sure their information matches. If there's a discrepancy, it's better to recognize that in the field, because that gives you an opportunity to recollect a traverse or two, rather than finding out once you get back in the office that you're missing data. Let's go ahead and collect line three.
And I'm just going to turn around and get myself set up on line four so I don't forget where I am. Hit the line button, new line, line four, line increment one. We're headed south. Our start station is 80. Station increment should be negative one. Ready to go, line four. All right, so that was the alternate survey pattern. You go down, you turn around, and you come back. You're surveying in two different directions. This instrument can also be used in a one-way survey pattern. The first traverse will be exactly the same. We will start at the 25 centimeter mark, and we would survey down to the north baseline. But then instead of coming back this way on Traverse 2, we would walk around and start at 75 centimeters here on the south baseline and do it that way. And there are settings in the data collector for a one-way survey. Using a one-way survey pattern instead of an alternate survey pattern costs you time because you're moving the instrument a lot without collecting data. In some cases, you're going to find that the environment that you're in is electromagnetically noisy. You're going to get very different readings when the instrument is facing north versus when it's facing south. Under these circumstances, it can be useful to use the one-way survey pattern rather than the alternate survey pattern because the alternate survey pattern will result in very, very stripy data. Using the one-way survey pattern in the field costs you time, but it eliminates the need to have to process those stripes out later on. After you finish collecting data on your last traverse, we found it's good practice to add a line of dummy data. You can do this just the same as when you're preparing yourself for another traverse. You just hit a new line, you let it advance. Let it collect a little bit of data. You don't have to do anything. You can look at the birds. Don't look straight at the sun. That's bad for you. You stop it. And then you've got an extra line at the end. And the person writing notes will note that that's a line of dummy data. The point of this is that if a line of data gets dropped out of the file when it's being saved or when it's being transferred for some reason, you're not losing your actual data. You're just losing a line of dummy data. We've also found it useful to add a little bit of dummy data at the very start of a new survey grid. What this gives you is a gap in the beginning that helps you orient that grid if you should ever become confused later on, six months later, when you're looking at the data about which direction you went, which direction it's going. It's another layer of redundancy to increase the chances that the data that you come out of the field with is going to be useful later.